once again, it's a great delight to be with you all. And uh, right away, uh, seeing this setting reminded me of, of quite a few places where we were with Baba, out under the trees. Baba always seemed to like to uh, be under the trees and uh, go and sit under a, a tree and have a contact with the earth and we gather around him and there might not be a discourse given or anything, but sometimes uh, there was. I recall so many different places. Uh, on Maribad Hill, where we sat around on the ground and, uh, under a tree, the bobbling against the tree. In Brook Green Gardens, south of Myrtle Beach, at the center in Myrtle Beach, and uh, you know, different places around. So uh, I suppose Baba would like this setting very much. And besides, I think we like it because it's a little cooler than it is in the hall over there. Well, our, our, our topic this afternoon is, uh, if I remember correctly, ways uh, to cultivate the inner life. And I expressly like the word cultivate because it implies uh, making a special effort and uh, realizing the need for a special consideration to do something about it. Now, I know that there are some here who have gardens and even do real farming. And they understand the meaning of and the importance of uh, cultivating. Um, ordinarily, in the in the spiritual life, we we may not really fully realize that it's it's very important to pull out weeds and to do a little hoeing and uh, to do everything we can to encourage the growth of all of it. Spiritual, it is our life, our spiritual life, our inner life that uh, we're trying to cultivate. Well, this means that in our busy everyday lives, we're going to, as you already know, have to find ways and means of working it in. <laughs> uh, where we can steal away for a few moments at, every day at least, more if we can manage the time, but to faithfully uh, attend to the cultivation of the inner life. I suppose this would would uh, conjecture uh, or convey. I don't mean conjecture. This would uh, bring up different pictures in different people's minds of what the inner life means. And I suppose it is something different for each individual. But in a way, it is becoming more conscious within, of, of a life within, of our, of our uh, spirit within. And uh, I think we're still addicted to the idea of making some kind of progress, um, uh, although, at least in one article that, in that Erich, uh, actually it was a, a little talk he gave and published as an article, The Destination in Our Midst, uh, for him, at least, in the Mandali, there is no such thing as spiritual progress. Baba is it. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, the whole path and the solution to everything is, of course, Baba. But as individuals, well, going back to my own life, uh, in the very early years, uh, when I began to get more consciously interested in spiritual things, uh, I had one or two friends, and uh, we would compare notes and, and what we were reading. And uh, there were many discoveries that, that which we felt were very helpful. For us at that time, I recall such things as uh, Thomas Kempis' The Imitation of Christ, uh, the discovery of the Bhagavad Gita, uh, you know, and many, many books along those lines, Wives of the Saints. And we would read them, hoping to get some clues, some ideas of what they did, uh, and see whether or not we could apply those same things to help open up our own inner life, our own awareness of it. Well, of course, Baba has uh, given us so much more about all of this. He has given, actually, a new name to it. He calls it the involution of consciousness. And uh, 
So he says, uh, is trying to make us aware that, that we've been through the exterior experiences in the world, the gross world, over and over and over again ad infinitum, <laughs> so that now we have reached the point, well, probably long since for most of us, when we are striving to become aware within, we're trying to undertake uh, the uh, involution, what Baba calls the involution of consciousness. And uh, during the course of this uh, we'll get together here, although it wasn't called a workshop, I think it would be more productive if we can uh, uh, have questions and answers and uh, I hope that we'll have time so that I can uh, even leave that topic and go on with some more about our experiences with Baba. Um, I'd like to at first address a, a question which was brought up in this morning's panel um, about uh, um, what, what would be called periods of uh, when Baba seems to be away from one and one seems to sort of lose contact and is kind of floundering around and what to do. You know, um, would you like to rephrase that question? Well, yeah, what would that do with uh, this? You know, sometimes one has a feeling that Baba's presence is there real close and feel, lot, feel Baba's love very strongly and everything. And then other times, you know, you know he's there with you and everything, but you now you just don't have a, you just don't have this great feeling of love for Baba. Mm -hmm. You maybe feel a little distant, or I guess that's just natural. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think every one of us knows exactly what you mean. Uh, we, I, I can think of several things. Uh, perhaps the, the most outstanding one that, that comes to mind is uh, one that Baba, a little thing that Baba gave us to do when we were in India in 1954. Uh, one day he said, uh, tomorrow or the next day I will... I will give you uh, an explanation about Sahaj Dhyan. That sounded very mysterious, and, and uh, you know, we thought it would be some some complicated Eastern technique, you know. <laughs> and uh, he said, "If you do this, you will you will be feeling Baba's presence with you all the time." So we were eagerly looking forward to an explanation of what Sahaj Dhyan. <laughs> so he told us it's really very simple <laughs> and it's so practical for people in the West uh, who have little time and he said uh, the very first thing when you get up in the morning uh, take just a few seconds even to dress your soul with Baba you have to think that over because uh, what does he mean? At first we think it's like putting on a cloak, but then he didn't say, uh, dress your body. He said, dress your soul. <laughs> the soul. We have to try to find the soul, don't we? It's somewhere within, isn't it? And uh, which means that we have to... It, it really it was a, a means of putting us to work because we have to think and, and try to find where it is that Baba wants us to dress. And it's, it's gradually, I think we find it's somewhere within our hearts, uh, you know, within our inner being where we have feelings. And uh, somehow we have to start uh, visualizing and trying to feel how it would be to dress our soul with Baba, but very quickly, and uh, then go about our day's activity. But he said, that is no, when it comes noon, do the same thing. He said, it won't take long, just about as long as it would take you to adjust your tie. And uh, make sure that your soul is dressed with Baba. And then at five o'clock, do the same thing. Dress your soul with Baba. And the fourth time, and the four times per day, just before retiring, again, make sure that your soul is dressed <coughs> He says, if you do this faithfully every day, you will soon discover that Baba's presence 
is with you all the time. <clears throat> so, of course, I think we were all eager to, to begin this. So, of course, in India, we were so thoroughly aware of Baba's presence with us all the time. That, but even so, we, we began to establish the pattern. And I know that some of us have been doing it ever since, uh, 1954, and found that he was telling us the truth, <laughs> that it really does work. So, uh, it, it really is a simple thing, but it does call upon one to, uh, to make an effort to visualize uh, not only his presence, but what he means. What, what, who is Baba? Uh, you know, it, it's more than the form. It is the divine love that he is, the unlimitedness, the freedom, the beauty, the whole thing, but all wrapped up in, in the context of that Baba who is very personal to us. So we mustn't think of it as an abstract thing, but a very personal thing. And I'm sure that in this regard, too, as he always said in any uh, instructions he gave us, he would always say, try and do your best and I will help you. And uh, so this is one thing that we, we can do. I mean, there are many other things. Uh, but this is one thing that, that can be very helpful. Now, if you want to take to do this, and I hope you all will, you, when you wake up in the morning, it, it's easy because you remember that. But then, 12 o'clock, oh, see, it's only 10 o'clock, <laughs> but you thought of Obama. Oh, it's 11 o'clock, but you thought of Obama. Well, it's 11.15, you know, <laughs> and you don't want to miss that 12 o'clock, and uh, so come 12 o'clock, you, <laughs> you're thinking of Baba, uh -huh. but, and uh, same around 5 o'clock, oh, it's only 3 o'clock, but you thought of Baba, <laughs> he knew what he was doing, <laughs> and uh, 4 o'clock, <laughs> and uh, so that after a while, you get to five o'clock and uh, you thought of Baba at five. And then you must remember not to forget at bedtime. And uh, you discover, if you think back, that you thought of Baba many more times than four times. <laughs> and uh, kind of tricky, wasn't it? <laughs> get us into that. But you will find out that uh, after a while, You'll we'll suddenly look at your clock, and it's exactly five o'clock. You would have forgotten, but Baba has reminded you, <laughs> or it's exactly twelve. But if you do go by twelve, at first we thought, oh, I missed it, what do I do now? Well, think of it then. You know, you may have forgotten for five minutes, or even a half hour or an hour, but think of it then. And go on to the next, next time, see? And, and, but don't worry about it. Don't make it a worrisome thing. Make it a, a pleasant thing. Something that you will enjoy. Because after all, Baba's presence is the most enjoyable thing we could experience. You know? So, uh, this is Sahaj Dhyan, which means spontaneous meditation. <laughs> so, uh, now, uh, I have some other things I can go to, but I wonder if anyone else has any questions <clears throat> along the line of cultivating the inner life that we could deal with right now. Yes. Feel you just had enough of bottle, or sometimes like you feel you feel sometimes you need a little something, but it's awful in a way. You think, well, I sort of need a breather, but I don't sort of want a breather. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly what you mean. That that too. Uh, uh, how do we deal with our minds? Its interests, our egos, and their interests, you know. And uh, uh, Baba said that we my, it's not we shouldn't try to coerce the mind. Um, and uh, our interests, after all, we he doesn't expect us to suddenly become ascetics or something like that. You know, you know, if we live in the world, we're exposed to all sorts of things and activities, and uh, uh, we're being 
encountered with all kinds of things all the time, and we, m many of them get through and actually become a disturbing uh, influence because they interest us and we get to thinking about them and our imagination gets going and first thing you know our desire nature gets going and and uh, we're way off in left field before we know what's happened. Uh, I think that becoming more aware of the inner life, little by little, we begin to discover how we how we uh, get sidetracked, um, and we we see that sometimes it will start with like a tiny little thread of thought, a suggestion, which will become a string. And then a rope, and then a cable, and first thing you know, here we are all bound up. So uh, by, by the time it's got that far, we're we you know, we're stuck. So uh, little by little, we we can learn how to uh, outmaneuver some of these things. Uh, it's like learning any any uh, thing we learn in life, any craft, any skill, you know. Uh, it's, it's always it's sort of an interesting thing to me that I'm in the same boat that uh, we think uh, the spiritual life should sort of unfold by itself. Mm -hmm. We understand that if we're going to play tennis, we have to start and, and work at it. If we're going to play the piano, if we're going to learn a computer, anything we do, we have to learn any kind of a technique, a skill, or, or going for a career. Everything takes time, and we really have to work at it. They're, they're the, the the scales, learning the scales, the boring part of it, all of that. And uh, it's the same way in the spiritual life. We we do have to go through that, um, and uh, it may require discipline. Who likes discipline? So, uh, but we, <laughs> but we. <laughs> uh, of course, Baba himself has given us many things like sublimation, which is a, another form, another term for redirection. If we can be aware of, of uh, a conspiracy that's taking place within to take us off into left field, if we can be aware of that starting off and uh, somehow uh, subtly and definitely get in there and introduce a different direction, you know, of our thoughts. And gradually, it may, our, our ego and our desire nature will be uncomfortable and complain at first, but uh, uh, try to do it as tactfully as possible, but redirect our energies. But all through everything we attempt to do, uh, try to ask Baba to help us. He, he, uh, he is proud of us when we will try, when we will make an effort. Now, all through our years with Baba, we observed that he was up to all kinds of schemes and ploys and what have you to keep us alert and on our toes, to keep our enthusiasm up, our interest and uh, our sense of anticipation. Uh, uh, all of these things are of, of great importance. And, of course, he, above all others, knew this and knows this. <coughs> and uh, he would want us, and we know, that we must m not slacken off. Uh, it is a, such a thing that that uh, to stand still is to go back. It's progression or retrogression. You cannot stand still and say, well, I'm going to take a resting place now. But you can't take a vacation from the spiritual life. Once you embarked upon that, it is a commitment uh, uh, which is in force at all times. Now I say that in spite of the fact that I know that all of us, uh, in spite of our best intentions, you know, don't set a straight course, we, we run a zigzag course because we want to, we want to run a straight course but uh, that desire nature and, and the things we could do uh, are so distracting. Now there was a, a sadhu, a Christian sadhu who lived in India many years ago. His name was Sadhu Sundar Singh. 
and uh, he told the story of wandering in the, the, the mountains of the Himalaya mountains and uh, he told of a certain kind of a flower that grew in those mountains and sometimes in traveling one would have to pass through a whole field of them and their effect upon the traveler was such that it would make the traveler sleepy and first thing you know if he wasn't worried he'd lie down to rest and fall asleep the flowers didn't kill him but he would sleep and go hungry and starve and die um, so with us too it's the same way it, there are many things that we say in life well they're nice things they, they don't do any harm you know but too many nice things put us to sleep <laughs> You know, and uh, begin to to uh, dull our inner senses. So, well, now does someone else have a broader question? I have a question, Darren. What about positive thinking? Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, I don't know how far any of you have gone into that. In the early days, especially Baba, in a few interviews, you may have read some of them. Baba did give affirmations to people and denials. Uh, like uh, he would tell a person who wanted to be an artist or a musician uh, and was struggling along, he'd say, think to yourself, I'm going to be the best artist or the best musician in the world. And uh, it's all right to do that. Mm -hmm. And it, is, it need not be an ego. Trip. It need not be an ego trip. And uh, he, through the years, he's, he would tell us, warn us against thinking negative thoughts, and of course, worrying. And he also said that what you want, you become. He didn't want us to become magicians or to to be aware of, of powers, and much less to use powers if we ever did become aware of them. Um, nor to try to really control our destiny. But he wanted us to realize that if we do have to think and do think, we should think in ways that uh, would be helpful. He, this is why he wanted us to not worry and be cheerful. Um, you see, without realizing it, we do unconsciously program a lot of things in our lives that we don't have to have and we don't need to continue to live with. Uh, uh, this isn't a, a, a solid science. I mean, there are many schools of thought on it. It explores a lot of things. But Baba said, even he went so far as to say that if we really wanted God, uh, we could have him very quickly. <laughs> but what can we do about that? We can want to want God. <laughs> right? We can, if we don't have, you know, the, the, the continuous momentum, we can ask Baba to help us to have that continuous momentum. And about being cheerful, Jesus even went so far as to say, uh, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world, which I translate into meaning, you too be of good cheer and you too will overcome the world. What does it mean? It's more profound than it seems because being of good cheer lifts one's spirit. You know, most people are depressed to some extent, but they do not know it. And when something lifts them up, they get it, they call it a high, because they're, they're so unused, unused to being free and having a cheerful, free uh, attitude. So if we can make an effort to be cheerful, our whole inner environment changes, uh, everything changes. And it also is a magical thing because we're unconsciously programming uh, things that will support and continue the syndrome of cheerfulness rather than anxiety or depression or whatever, you see. I think that Baba meant don't worry as an order. <laughs> don't worry, be happy. And... Uh, See, don't worry is something that we can banish, you can banish worry, and assert happiness. Now, by not worrying, he meant 
have trust. Don't worry, trust. We worry because we don't trust. If we trust Him, trust God, trust Baba, completely, you see, we don't, we, we don't fully believe that He is omnipotent, that He could do anything, that He could take care of everything. We take His measure. Imagine, we unconsciously measure God. And He doesn't, you know, we don't consciously do this. But if we really believe He is omnipotent, and that He really loves us and wants us to be free, we would trust Him, and we would turn everything over to Him. And now, let me tell you about this aspect. At different times when we would be with Baba, He would, he would stress different things. In 1956, when we were with Baba, He started on this theme in New York City. One time, uh, similar to the uh, experience we talked about as a family this morning, we were with Baba as a family. And uh, he, he told us most lovingly that we belong to him. And uh, <clears throat> he said, if, if you really love Baba, you must give him everything. Hold nothing back. He said, give Baba all of your sufferings and all of your pleasures. And of course this means all of our moods and all of our feelings that uh, we hang on to. Of, uh, envy, anger, fear, uh, being put upon or belittled or, or a pride or uh, you know, all, all kinds of things. He said, well, you must hold nothing back. Give Baba everything. And the trump card was, and he said, and be free, and be free. It was so simple. Give Baba everything, and be free. And can we do that? <laughs> then, then to add to it, he said, this will be Baba's pleasure. We would please him if we did this. Can you imagine? We would love to bring him a big bouquet of beautiful flowers every day, but all of the rubbish you know, that we accumulate within to give him that, that would please him. Why would it please him? Because it's helping him with his work. His work with us is to help us to be free. He's, he's dedicated to helping us to be free. He wants us to be free, to really be free. So, this does not mean that he relieves us of all responsibility. We are, and he wants us to be responsible persons, responsible for our thoughts and actions and our feelings, but to give everything to him. It is especially the residue of actions and thoughts and feelings that we have in, inside, that uh, and we, we struggle with them, and we feel that we must struggle with them. And we have internal wrestling matches and contests and conflicts. And of course, this is all at the level of the ego, you know. <laughs> and uh, so this simple thing, it's too simplistic. We would say to Baba, but you can't really mean it. You know, it isn't that simple, is it, Baba? <laughs> but it is. Baba illustrated this to me so literally in India in 1954. 54. <laughs> well, you know, I always, all through the years, longed to go to India, to be with Baba in India. Um, and finally, in the spring of 1954, this message came uh, that Westerners, I have it here, maybe you'd like, I think I have it here, maybe you'd like to have me just uh, read a little bit of it. I don't know if I have it or not. Yes, there it is. This simple little little flyer came through. It was all about a big meeting at Meherabad in 1954 and about two big meetings 
on the 29th and 30th of September 1954, and it was addressed especially to Baba's Eastern men. And then down at the bottom as an addendum, <laughs> almost forgotten, you know, it seemed, it went on to say, the above has been circulated to all Baba lovers in India and Pakistan. As Baba's men disciples and devotees in the West, men disciples, may also participate, Baba's had the following addendum, <laughs> specifically included. <laughs> Any one of Baba's men disciples or devotees in the USA who would care to come to this meeting, who is able to do so without jeopardizing his job, and who can afford the journey to India and back, may come. <laughs> wow, in that case, can you imagine? <laughs> After all those years, and uh, hmm. there were further instructions, but um, <laughs> so when that came, uh, I suddenly realized I could go. And then backtracking, I realized that Baba had done something with my finances in 1952 that made it possible for me now go to India. <clears throat> I could borrow the money. At that time it cost $1,172. It took 48 hours <laughs> by propeller plane. <laughs> That's a whole saga in itself. And uh, so, uh, <clears throat> when I got that, my spirit immediately went out to Bama and my journey had already begun. Prior to that, there was a lady who I feel was, you know, quite advanced spiritual, used to attend our meetings, and she was quite psychic. And prior to getting this, uh, during one of the meditation periods, she afterwards told me that she had seen a figure in back of me who seemed to be from the Far East, and he had a chalice in his hand. And he said, I've come from far across the sand, and he said some other things which I don't remember, but he gave the figure four, and she said in four something, four days, weeks, or months, I feel it will be four months, you will be making a long trip, and I think it will be to the Far East. <laughs> <laughs> so she was right in her uh, analysis of what she saw. And the chalice was, that's just another story in itself, um, one, maybe not today, but sometime during these talks, I'll tell you what that meant. I hope to. But anyway, my journey had already begun, and it is a journey of the spirit. We do travel in the spirit. I keep going from one thing to the other. We travel in the spirit. This is where our real journey is, in the spirit. We're so preoccupied with life that our spirit stands still or waits around. You know, we can know our spirit. But sometimes we find a few moments and of inspiration and we can turn our gaze away from the world and look toward Baba, look toward God, look toward reality, and move a little bit in the spirit toward Him. You see? This is our real journey. The rest of this is, you know, a <laughs> hundred miles we go. And uh, so, actually, about four months later, I did go to India, and I say that was a story in itself. Many things happened along the way. But uh, being in India, I'm, I'm going to jump into the middle of this. I hope to tell you more about it this time to them. But being in India, one day, shortly after arriving there, I found myself on Mayor Bad Hill, and I was thinking about, here I am in India, and with Brahma. How could this possibly be? This is impossible, you know. How could I be here, you know? And I thought, of all the people in the world, there must be thousands, maybe millions, who far more than I deserve to be here. <laughs> but here I am. You know? And I was so grateful to the depths of my being. And I thought uh, I, w I would respond to this, this uh, great gift from Baba with all my heart. And I would also take advantage of this opportunity with all my inner resources. And that meant to surrender 
as much of myself as I possibly could to, to, to shed, to give, to somehow give everything that I possibly could. Um, and it didn't even occur to me that Baba knew anything about my thoughts, how naive I was. <laughs> I later realized that Baba had plunged me into a deep inner level where I must work and wanted to work and was able to work. And so I started working and struggling at the, in this uh, inner level and trying to discard things and shed them and give them to Baba and unload and unburden. And uh, um, I seemed to be making pretty good progress. Uh, nothing was said outwardly. Baba didn't give me any sign that he knew I was doing anything. And, uh, so, uh, but after a couple of days, I, I seemed to run into a, a, a like a solid block within, and there wasn't a thing I could do with it. I, I, I couldn't let go of it. I, I didn't know how to disentangle from it, I couldn't do anything with it. So I thought, well, I guess that's it. But I was very grateful to have been able to have made that much progress. And, you know, again, it didn't, how naive I was. It, I didn't I think that Baba was aware, it didn't occur to me that he, you know, was aware of it, that he precipitated it. And uh, so the one day, I think it was the same day when Baba had Godavari Mai and the women from Sikori, over to show them around. And uh, on this occasion, Baba was standing like, you know, maybe 20, 15 feet away from me. And uh, Baba didn't look at me, but I was aware of, uh, I don't know how to describe this because I'm not psychic. I say I'm not, I, some things I'm aware of. I was aware of uh, this great, I don't know how to describe it, a wave of, uh, of fire, of light, of beauty, of power. It was divine love that seemed to quickly come from Baba and zip right through and uh, the, the whole thing, all this blockage and everything, it just swept it away. But as it was leaving, I discovered only then that I was holding it tightly and even as it was being pulled away, I was still holding on to it. <laughs> We engage these things in conflict and hold on to them while we're trying to get rid of them. But I found out then that nothing, but nothing, can stand in the way of Baba's divine love. Love, grace it is. So it just swept it away. And I knew perfectly what had happened and Baba knew that I knew. We both knew back and forth, but we didn't. He didn't look at me. I glanced at him, but he didn't look at me. But we knew what happened. And Baba was to go down the hill then. And this connects with that, didn't he? And uh, <clears throat> I just stood there, you know, completely overwhelmed. Suddenly, I was free. I was blissfully free and happily free. I had no problems. Nothing. I, I, I felt complete. I felt restored to wholeness. I really felt totally integrated, complete. And I said to myself, I, I was instantly reminded of the 23rd Psalm. And from that, I gratefully and joyfully exclaimed, He restored my soul. He restored my soul. I found my soul. I hadn't found it. He had made it possible for me to be aware of it. It is already there within us. He restored my soul, which means one is restored to wholeness. The wanting machine is stopped for a while. <laughs> the desire of nature is stopped. Anything, any needs from out there are off. One is complete. This is complete fulfillment. I didn't get God realization, I don't mean that. But it was a moment of grace, a moment of, of 
of you know soul for fulfillment. And Baba was going to, leading us down. He was going to light the Dooney fire, and you saw on the slides last night him sitting there while the Dooney fire was burning. That was the time. And as he was going down the hill, I hurried to catch up. But all the time, I said to myself, "Here's the fire. Baba is the fire." because I experienced that fire. And then I knew what the flame of Zoroaster is, the flame of divine love. It burns everything, you know, in an instant. <laughs> you see, the fire of divine love. And so, in our giving things to Baba, really let try to let go, you know. You see, also this means try to stop wanting. Wanting is a statement. The statement is, I do not have, therefore I want. <laughs> it is a denial of our own completeness. We say, I want, oh, that will make me feel more complete. That will make me happy. That is what I need. I want that, I want that. Uh, I want, I want, I want, I want. <laughs> All day long we're saying, what do I want to wear? What do I want to eat? What do I want to hear? You know, I want all the time. If for a few moments every day we could stop wanting and be content in Baba's love, we might discover our own soul. Baba wants us to. Sometime Sooner or later, we're going to stop wanting and experiencing fulfillment, experiencing contentment, which will come from within. It is already there. We are already complete. Now, there's one other aspect which I feel I must must introduce at this time. You know, Adi. Irani, uh, you must have experienced, uh, I think on his last time over here, he would uh, greet people very often with uh, people he knew, you know, well, like even me, you know, say, hello, how are you? And he'd look at you strangely and say, who are you? <laughs> Why are you? What all that? <laughs> And it was very provocative. So, <laughs> and, and Baba issues this challenge to us too. And you know, his work with us is to eliminate the ego. We don't want it eliminated, but we agree that we've come to him for the elimination of the ego. But at the same time, we don't really want it eliminated <laughs> because it's. It's going to be unpleasant, it's going to be painful, and, and uh, you know, uh, what do we have if we don't have the ego? You know, we have all kinds of arguments against it, and we want it to be delayed as long as possible. But uh, not realizing that maybe it would be better even if we didn't have it. <laughs> it could be better. <laughs> so, uh, the question comes up, am I a good person or a bad person? Uh, am I inferior or superior? What kind of a person am I? And Maya tells us all these things. Oh, you're a bad person. Or now you're a good person. You can feel I'm a good person. Or now you must feel you're a bad person. Now you must feel unhappy because of this. Now you can feel it. So we listen to Maya, and, and uh, we're listening to her instead of to Baba. And uh, we, we uh, equate happiness with our feelings in relation to I and me. I feel happy because of this. I feel unhappy because of that. And we're with someone who makes us feel inferior, you know. Suddenly we're down the ladder. And we're other people who make us feel superior. And things happen that make us feel, oh, now I'm good. And other times we feel, wow, what a terrible person I am. Perhaps that's worse, more than, that happens more than the other. And uh, anyway, I feel that the real nothingness that Baba is leading us toward involves discovering our own nothingness. We, we understand 
that as a physical body, sooner or later we have to let it go. It, it, it will go whether we want it to or not. It must go. And it is a transient thing. Um, but we think, well, uh, the mind, the personality will be there. But after a while, I think that Baba will help us with the understanding of, uh, and in some way he helps us with the understanding of who we are and who we are not. The peeling of the onion, as Charles uh, described it, is discovering who and what we are not. And uh, it is also a balancing of opposites, good and bad, high and low, inferior, superior, all these things. And in balancing these opposites, I feel that Baba eventually brings us to the happy discovery that we are nothing. <laughs> really, really nothing. Not a good, I'm not a good person. I'm not a bad person. You know, I'm not superior. I'm not inferior. Uh, just nothing. I have a little poem to read on that by... Um, Oh, what's the name? By Emily Dickinson. I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us. Don't tell. They vanish us, you know. How dreary to be somebody. How public, like a frog. <laughs> to tell your name the live long day to an admiring bog. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so, still at that? Yes. So I, I feel that we must go along with it when Baba, in his own ways, leads us to the discovery that we really are nothing. It's not an unpleasant discovery. <laughs> We're nothing. <laughs> not even our own dog. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so how did the opposites get balanced? Baba takes care of the other side. In ourselves, we are nothing. But in him, we are everything, because he is everything. So in him, we discover the opposites of the nothing and the everything. So, but we must be reconciled to this discovery of our own nothingness. And it could make one very, very peaceful, very, very tranquil within to discover that one really is nothing, that one doesn't have to struggle with I am good or I am bad and all of that. It, it sort of ties in with Baba's love and his grace. He says, don't worry, be happy. In my love. That last part must not be left out because it is also his love grace. We will find our, find our sustenance. We will be sustained by his love, which is also truth, which is also reality which is also our own true self. So, he said, if you love me with all your heart at your level, I will take you to my level. But it isn't that it will be I who get there. It is he who is there, and it is he who shares the kingdom of God with us. By being willing to become nothing, which we really are, it makes it possible for that door to open and for us to enter the Spirit and find our abode in Him. To accept the treasure which He offers us with open hands, the treasures of the Kingdom of God, here and now. He has been called the Redeemer. What is the sense of having a Redeemer if one does not accept redemption? 
Why have a savior if you don't experience salvation? Without getting into theological concepts or doctrines or anything else, Baba offers us redemption. He offers us salvation. To know that we are experiencing it. He offers us to be born of the Spirit. When we came to Baba, we came to him in the physical, but he made it possible also for us to come to him consciously in the spirit, from the heart, the whole heart, in the spirit. And we are spirit. We are not body. He made it possible for us to know and to be happy with the discovery that we are spirit. And as spirit, we are timeless. We are not creatures of time. Time is a creation of Maya. We've been hoodwinked by this for centuries. And Baba has come to dispel this wicked witch of the north, or <laughs> wherever she comes from. <laughs> so we need not be tyrannized by Maya through her creation of time, nor through her creation of the opposites. We have been victimized by duality for countless centuries. And it is time for us to throw off the tyranny of the opposites by accepting sanctuary in Baba's love, grace, and daring to assert the truth, to take our stand upon the truth that he is, and let the truth, which cannot be challenged, function as the guiding genius in our lives, rather than submitting to any further tyranny of the opposites in Maya. We can do this, perhaps slowly, by refusing to feel overly exhilarated when something pleasant happens and refusing to feel overly depressed when something unpleasant happens. Stop that pendulum from swinging. Stop reacting to Maya and center in Baba's love, grace, which is the truth. It is the reality. And this is what he wants. This is freedom. Where will we be free? From here. Here is where we have been bound. We will feel it in our heart centers. The gates will be flung open. And our spirits will be able to rise. And we will be begin to be free. We want these come. By doing everything we can, to be free, we are helping him and his work with us. He comes to us as individuals. We think that, oh, how does he know I even exist? But he does. We are his work. His work is to make us free so that we may experience freedom in him. So everything we can do to accept that freedom will lighten his work with us. He's offering us something and we, we can't believe that he's really offering it to us. It is grace, of course. It is freedom. He wants to experience his freedom. So it is salvation which we can experience. It is not God realization per se. We're not asking for that. We're not really asking for anything. But he wants us to be free and to find our security in him. He is our sanctuary. He is our security. He is omnipotent. He is the truth. He puts in our hands a powerful sword, the sword of truth, which he expects us to, to wield in our battles with Maya. So when Maya comes up and tantalizes us or tempts us or challenges us, we can wield the sword of truth 
and destroy. With his help, it is Rama working through us. For Jesus said it this way, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. But we must assert the truth in our lives and live by that truth, dare to live by the truth from the heart. And let the heart be free. Let the spirit be free. Dare. Baba says it takes daring. This is where the daring is. To dare to leap across the abyss of duality and take our stand upon the truth in him. He will help us all the way. Our hand is in his hand. He wants us to make this step to accept his offer, his gift. I'm getting into my next talk. What am I going to talk? But, um, oh, well, now at this point, maybe someone has some thoughts or questions. Yeah. Um, did you have comment on keeping this? The spiritual and inner life in your family really strong. Could I comment on that? In other words, if, if you had any um, special ways that, that you could share that helped you to keep the spiritual and, you know, travel life alive in your marriage and in your family relationship? Well, yes, indeed, I can. <laughs> uh, yes. Well, uh, you see, our family life is not apart from our Baba life. It is a part of it. And, uh, of course, we've read with great interest about the uh, life that Baba uh, worked out for the close Mandali, the Mandali, the Manzili mean days, and, you know, different experiences through the years, the discipline and all that, and ways and means of whittling down the sharp edges and getting at the ego, you know. And curiously enough, he's using our circumstances where we are, whether we're married or, or not married, we're in a family life of some sort or among people, he uses those very circumstances to do these same things. Now, we're out in the world and uh, we, we, uh, we're still somewhat addicted to self-assertion for our rights. We don't want, want people to walk all over us and, you know, we think that's important. But after a while we discover that maybe our values should undergo a change. Uh, maybe we'd make a point if we gave in on something rather than claiming our rights all the time, you know? And in family life this is very important. Uh, to learn how to uh, uh, not make waves um, and uh, to try to please the ones we are with, to try to make life more pleasant, happier for them, and uh, to be willing to make personal sacrifices uh, to make them happy, but very quietly one mustn't say anything about it or, you know, be a hero or uh, or a, a martyr or anything, but uh, to be cheerful and uh, self-effacing, but not in an, not in an ostentatious, ostentatious way. And we will think afterwards, yeah, I could have handled that differently. It's good to think about that. How should I have handled that? You know, I, you know, that came on me so suddenly I didn't see it coming, and I blew my top. You know, things I said, wow. You know. <laughs> Uh, so, we, I think we have to school ourselves to try to be aware, well, now that's going to lead into that, and if I reply to that sharply, no, I don't think that way, you know, <laughs> it's going to lead into the next thing, and the next thing, the first thing you know, we're going to be way out there and shouting at each other. <laughs> so, I think we have to, to uh, be as wise as serpents, but as harmless as doves. Jesus said that. And uh, we find, we can find, as you probably all know, that this, this helps. It really, every, things begin to happen. And uh, our family life can get better. I, I, I'm not giving you marriage counseling, but I mean, <laughs> uh, I know that it can get better. 
and of course, for a Baba family, um, all parties involved realize that it's not just one-sided. They must all make an effort, you know. And uh, we all know that Baba wants us to make an effort, and that it is in this very context that he's working with us. He has a, a consummate insight to all of our sanskaras, all of our karma, all of our problems. He devises all kinds of ways and means to bring up confrontations and situations wherein we will be able to learn how to handle these things and to grow. We are we're in the process of growing and maturing. You see? So all of this is involved. Yes. Not really. Once in a while, I'll look something up, you know. But uh, years and years ago, I, I did. I, I never became a fanatic per se, you know. At it, you know. So I, I mean, I can't quote you, John, so and so, and you know, so and so. <laughs> brothers of the cloth do. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I, for me, I. Uh, I really found the kingdom of heaven through Jesus, the experience of it. Uh, so I cannot deny that. I know that Baba meant for that to happen. And unfortunately, I was never tied in with any fundamentalist group or anything like that, you know? Yeah. Uh, what would you say, or have you ever met a person who... Uh, enjoyed the extremes of emotional life. Oh, sure. Yeah. Lots of people do. Yeah, they do. <laughs> oh, they wallow in it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know. I guess I've been through that, too. Um, um, how I've been put upon and, uh, from the one extreme and what a great guy I am, you know, everybody likes me. <laughs> All that stuff. And the extremes. And, uh, um, yeah. Um, it's, it's hard to, to be around people like that, uh, and especially if you have to, uh, you know, try to help them at all. Because I know therapists have difficulty with people like that because uh, they don't realize that they, they're really, their ego is thriving on it in many cases, but uh, they don't know what is happening. Um, but. Uh, uh, Baba says that the more we can go through our experiences without feeling any special ego consciousness, the better it'll be. You know, try to avoid, I did this, you know, gee, I made a botch of that, or I succeeded in that. Try not to bother about it. Try to be, this is why, oh, I didn't even get into it. Attitudes are so important. Attitudes are of the utmost important importance. See, our inner currents uh, have been directed toward ourselves so much. Uh, what can I get? Bring things to me. I'm looking to the world for, for fulfillment for myself. So that our inner currents are directed toward ourselves. And the spiritual life redirects our currents toward others. Our inner attitude of selfless service, of, of, of giving, uh, can be of tremendous help. It rearranges our currents. Love is not a getting. It is a givingness. And in the giving, one experiences fulfillment. And uh, we are meant not to be receptacles, but channels. We, we, we all discover that the spiritual path is one of service, one of self-forgetfulness and service. And if, if being willing to let Baba do whatever he wants to do through us can be a great help to us. We can be a channel of his love, grace, current of his rhythm, uh, and it, we need not know what he wants us to do, we need not 
think, well, Bobby wants me to do this and do that. It, it's better if we don't know. I remember one time Sam Cohen, one of the early American uh, disciples, was telling me that when Baba was here one time, he said to Sam, what are you doing? Sam said, nothing just now. And Baba said to him, can you go to Mexico for six months? And Sam said, yes, Baba. Well, what will I do there? Baba said, I don't care what you do there. <laughs> <laughs> so Sam said, I went to Mexico for six months. And, you know, uh, he was a contemplative type, but he just sort of bummed around. And, <laughs> he, he, he didn't. He wasn't conscious of making any special effort to do anything, you know. You know? So we don't have to know that Baba wants me to go to you and tell you this or that. No, it's just to, to be willing to to let Baba work through whatever he wants to do. Take love for example. Baba stresses love. Did you ever try to love the people in your whole block where you live? <laughs> Two blocks. <laughs> Three blocks. Four blocks. Envelop them in your love. Five blocks. The whole city. Try it. Envelop the whole city in your love, the whole country, the whole world. Start small, though, but take the boundaries away. Why should you not be bound? This also will give you freedom, give you unlimitedness. You are unlimited. Baba tells us we are infinite. It is our limitations that he wants to take away from us through love. Love dissolves everything. And we are able to love unlimitedly because he makes it possible. Well, any other questions? Thoughts? Yeah. yeah. How about uh, the workplace? Like, Granny I heard you mention your, your career and how Baba affected it one way or the other, and challenges that Baba might have brought up with superiors or inferiors. Superiors. Yeah. Well, I, I don't. I can't. I just can speak for myself. I, I was led to my job at a certain period in my life, and I, I felt that I was divinely led to be there. The job wasn't an outstanding job. Job. It was a very simple job with the city of Schenectady, and it did lead into advancement and all that. But in that job, I could be very close to the people. And I felt that I must love the people and, and, and just feel for them, the people of the city. I worked for the city of Schenectady, and I felt from the start that I, I, I worked for the people. I didn't feel I was working for the politicians. I felt that I was a servant of the people. And if in your job, you can feel that you are rendering a service. No matter where your job is, try to feel that you are rendering a service to someone, to, to everyone, this will make your job worthwhile. It isn't the money. Of course you have to have money. But the real purpose of your job is that you are rendering a service. And it gives you a chance to love humanity. It's important that we love humanity. This is why Jesus gave us this second uh, law, not only that we must love God with all our hearts and minds and souls, but that we must love our neighbor as ourselves, because he, our neighbor is ourselves. We need to love others' humanity. We need this. And I felt this need. And I, of course, I was in the traffic department and started at the bottom and worked up. But uh, uh, my work required, as I, as I got along, I, it was a lot of detailed work and a lot of mental work. But I could be by myself a lot too, but I eventually had a lot of men under me and so much detail work. But uh, I would find, strangely enough, that uh, even in the midst of that, sometimes, e even like the boss there and somebody else, I would suddenly find myself in India. <laughs> Inward, inwardly. <laughs> you know, just a brief feeling, well, here I am in India. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> you know? Um, um, I, I couldn't explain it, I couldn't do it myself, but 
it, it was something that just happened. You know? um, um, but uh, there would be, all through it, there would be trying things, especially working with men. Men under me, I, I, I soon learned that one must be very tactful and, uh, and giving men orders, especially men who feel they got their jobs through politics and nobody should try to order them around and things like that. But still I had to get a quarter of work out, you know, and uh, how to get around each one and make him feel that he's doing something he should be doing and uh, that it's a pleasant thing to do and not a burdensome thing and that I'm not a tyrant or <laughs> Simon agree and all that. And uh, also feel that we're really giving the taxpayer their money's worth, you know. There's so many aspects were involved, I know, in my job. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure the same thing uh, happens in everyone's job. And in many cases, the job requires that one must concentrate so much on it that one hasn't even a second, it seems, to think of the spiritual life or a Bob or anything. And I think Adi answered that very well when someone posed that question to him. He said, it's like my, my parents. I don't have to all the time think that they are my parents. I know they're my parents. <laughs> <laughs> They're always my parents. That won't change. He said, and this is the way we can feel about Baba. He is our beloved. He will be our beloved. He's, we can be secure in that. And we belong to him. And we don't have to worry about that. We, we, we might think, of course, I mean, he said, if you have to worry about anything, it's worry about how we love him. But, but we should feel secure in that. And he understands that we have to be very practical and uh, very efficient in our jobs and do them well. He wanted everyone to try to do their best and to give their full attention to their jobs. He didn't allow his mandali to go sit in caves and meditation. None of that. He found work for everyone and everyone must do it very well to the very best of their ability. Make, uh, very important to be practical. I know I had to learn to be very practical. At first, I was inclined to to uh, inwardly meditate and think of myself as sitting in a cave in Tibet, you know, and just physically being out there in the world doing my work. But that was a form of mental transcendentalism and gymnastics, which, you know, <laughs> was kind of childish. <laughs> uh, he wants us to be there. You were right there. He said, when you experience God, it isn't that you go up to him, he comes down to you. He comes down to you where you are. You feel that he comes to you at your level. Because he is at that level. There is no separateness in reality. Someone asked Baba one time, <clears throat> is it possible with a finite mind to grasp the infinite? And Baba smiled at him and said, there is no finite. <laughs> there is no finite. He said, what you think is finite, eventually you will discover that, that too is the infinite. The infinite cannot be divided. There are no divisions. So we are there now. We are at the goal now. We are at the center of the universe. We are there now, because we are with Baba. He is the way to the goal and the goal. And because we have chosen this way, already we may have the privilege of participating in the goal. The goal is here. Now, the truth is not an object to be sought in the future. Again, Maya has tricked us into thinking that the goal, the, the truth, and the goal are in the future. Many lives ahead. You know, but it, the truth is now. We drag along the past and we project in the future. We have no time for the present. This is why stopping the warning machine and trying to be content in the now will help us to discover the truth that is here now. Baba is in the now. Someone asked him if he was going to be a certain place next May. Look at the person said, 
that next May doesn't exist for me. <laughs> Time doesn't exist for me. <laughs> I'm always in the present, you see. The truth is always in the present. When we experience the truth, I feel, it will be in the midst of all of our sanskaras, in the midst of all the things we must be involved in, all the problems, all the karma, everything. And the truth cuts through all of that. The truth cannot make a contest, I mean, Maya cannot make a contest with the truth. We will have to discover this and assert it with Baba's love. Baba, I mean, it isn't that we can do it mentally, but it is Baba who, who will bring this through to us. This is why he wants us to be more at ease in his love, to rest in his love, to feel comfortable in his love. Even if we have to take another incarnation, another one, another one, so on and on, we will find our sanctuary, our salvation, our security in his love. And we're already at the goal. We, he is the destiny in our midst, as Eric said. So with that, let me say, I've enjoyed talking with you. Jay Baba. Jay Baba.